The scripture reading is John 15, 1 through 17. I am the true vine, and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit he prunes, so that he will be even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Remain in me, and I will remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine. You are the branches. If a man remains in me, and I in him, he will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not remain in me, he is like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up and thrown into the fire and burned. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be given to you. This is to my Father's glory, that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Now remain in my love. If you obey my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have obeyed my Father's commands and remain in his love. I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. My command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that he laid down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends for everything I have learned from my father that I, I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you, and appoint you to go and bear fruit, a fruit that will last. And then the Father will give you whatever you ask in my name. This is my command, love each other. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Well, as, you, Mark, uh, as uh, Matt just said, I'm not uh, preaching today. I uh, had a tough week, and so I searched far and wide for someone to replace me. Uh, called Europe, Australia, <laughs> everywhere I could find someone to preach. And finally, I found the right person, my son-in-law. So Noah Thomas is going to come and uh, share the word with us today. And um, give him more grace than you give me, please. No heckling. <laughs> no throwing things, no gathering in the back to plot demise of the person. Just listen, and God will, will speak. So, Noah, come on up. All right, so, um, with that said, let's, let's pray. Uh, Father, we come before you. And we ask that you would work in the reading and the preaching of the word from your gospel this morning. Um, we ask that you would work in us and you would work through the power of your Holy Spirit. As the song that we just sang says, um, you would plant the word down deep in us. And I just ask a special, uh, for a special moment here that you would uh, really come into into this room, into our hearts, um, into my heart, and um, open open up our hearts so that we can listen and understand the words of your gospel and the words that were spoken by your son Jesus so many years ago. Um, I pray that you would help us to grow in grace and spiritual maturity as this word grows in us. And as in all things, we ask this in the name of your son Jesus. Amen. Amen. All right, so um, thank you for that warm welcome. Uh, I, was in, I was in Germany when Phil finally tracked me down. Um, and, uh, you know, I know a number of you, but uh, many of you I don't know. And uh, for those of you who I don't know yet, my name is Noah Thomas. Um, and you have to know that this message, uh, whatever is in it, was pre-approved the moment that um, Phil uh, married me to his daughter, Justine. So... Um, so if you have any problems, you can talk to Phil. <laughs> um, but in all seriousness, it really is, um, it, it really is uh, not to belabor it, but it, it's, it's uh, an honor for me to come and preach here because I do really look up to Phil. Um, he's a tremendous preacher. Um, you know, he may be uh, 
hiding behind a, a folksy demeanor and uh, self-deprecating humor, but he really is a, a faithful servant of God, and he's he's an excellent preacher. So uh, to share the podium uh, really is an honor, and um, and I hope this goes well. <laughs> so um, I guess I want to start by saying, uh, just asking this um, broad and, and pretty direct question, which is, um, how would you describe your relationship with God? Or how, how do you describe, how do you put in words um, what our relationship with God is supposed to be like? Um, and I ask that because this passage that was just read for you, um, it, it addresses what that relationship, um, what, how, that, how that relationship works, and what the purpose of that relationship is. Um, and so to help paint a picture of, of what that means in the passage, I want to tell you about an acquaintance of mine, uh, mine named Jim. And so um, there we go, there's Jim. So uh, that's a photo of Jim, and he's an actor among other things you can probably guess from that photo. Um, this is a photo of him in the title role uh, as Hamlet in the St. Louis um, Shakespeare Theater, excuse me, the St. Louis Shakespeare Festival's production of Hamlet uh, from a number of years ago. While he's an actor, he's also a seminary graduate, um, he's a Bible teacher, and even a former monk. <laughs> How did he get there? It's an interesting story. So, he was living in New York. Um, in, by, by the late 90s, he was living in New York. He's a few years older than me. He's trying to make it as an actor, but he knew something was missing in his life. What it was, he wasn't quite sure. Um, but he knew that there was something missing. If you ask him, he would say he was living a life of debauchery. Um, he was living with a group of people who were promiscuous, um, who relied on substances and maybe beverages to help them to, to feel loved. And really, he was nearing rock bottom. But interestingly, in the same way that Hamlet is pursued by the ghost of his father, Jim was also being pursued, but by a different kind of ghost. Twice he had been approached by street evangelists who were handing out tracts that spoke of Jesus and sin and salvation, and each time he had reacted in scorn and hostility to these attempts to reach him spiritually. And then September 11th, 2001 came. Jim was on a subway headed home when the train stopped and everybody exited because it had lost power. He finally made his way up to the street where it was utter chaos. It was a horrific scene that greeted him. Um, he was near ground zero. He saw things that you've heard about in news reports. I don't need to describe them for you. Probably, uh, they're probably, we can call up images in our memory of them. I don't need to describe them. He walked around there in a daze, but at some point, a young boy handed him a tract, so this is the third time now, with a simple prayer to pray to accept Jesus. And there, with the world literally falling apart around him, the pursuit ended. He prayed that prayer, and he found what was missing. So I'd like to consider this for a moment. We'll come back to Jim's story in, uh, with an epilogue uh, oh. at the end, so that's when you'll know that the sermon's about to be over. <laughs> uh, I'd like you to consider this for a moment. Something was missing, but who was it, or what was it? <clears throat> so that's, um, there's a, a little question mark. There we go, yes, what was missing, okay. When we find what's missing, we step back for a second, think about this, when we find what's missing, we discover that we have a purpose. This passage addresses this. Actually, um, this passage identifies it as a command. Love each other as I have loved you. In Jim's story, we see the, the arc of this passage play out. God pursues, God loves, and then God commands. He pursues us, he loves us in an incredibly intimate way, and he also commands us to love each other. So, first let's tackle this idea that God pursues us. In this passage, it's not necessarily explicit um, that it's God who first pursues us, but he does. And we can draw this almost from the order uh, which exists throughout this passage. In verse 5, it says, I am the vine, you are the branches. If a man remains in me, and I in him, and, and so on. 
In verse 9, it says, As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Now remain in my love. What I'm trying to point out here is that God acts first, and then it, it goes God first, then us, his followers. That is the order. And the reason I point that out is it's the same order of things that we have in our relationship with God throughout the whole Bible. We don't choose him first, he chooses us. And I'm not trying to open up some sort of debate about election and, um, and, and uh, predestination or anything like that. Um, it's what you see going through the whole scriptures. Any direction or instruction in the Bible, you know, when God says do this, even the Ten Commandments, um, it comes as a result of God first reaching down to save us as an act of grace. And then obedience is the response and not the prerequisite. In other words, obedience is not the requirement for being saved. God acts first and acts graciously. And then in response to that grace, our proper response is to obey, is to, is to be obedient. Um, and that's how the relationship with, work, uh, with him works. He pursues us first and then we accept him. God doesn't lack anything but he wants something from us. And there's a beautiful illustration of this idea of pursuit in a poem that was published in 1893. And this is, some, uh, this is a photo of the 1926 edition. You can see it on Project Gutenberg. Um, it's a great resource. And um, the reason I, I bring this to you, this is a po poem that was published in 1893 by an English poet named Francis Thompson. So in this poem, The Hound of Heaven, God is pictured as a hound pursuing a man relentlessly as he tries to flee throughout his life. And maybe some of you can relate to that, right? It's, but it's this idea of pursuit. And you see the feet there and the sort of holy fire emanating from it. It's a weird like symbol, but, but that is the symbol for God who's pursuing that man, right? Because um, he talks about the, the feet in the poem. So this is how the poem starts out. I fled him down the nights and down the days. I fled him down the arches of the years. I fled him down the labyrinthine ways of my own mind. And in the mist of tears, I hid from him and under running laughter. Up visted hopes I sped and shot precipitated a down titanic glooms of chasmed fears from those strong feet that followed, followed after. So it's this description of God pursuing him and him running away. And um, again, you see those feet that are mentioned, pictured right there. So again, in, um, there's, some, there's something else that va uh, valuable that comes from this poem. In the introduction to the 1926 edition, which is what, what this is right here, there's an, another author who's writing about Thompson, and he relates this exchange um, that he had with a professor about this poet, Francis Thompson. And so the professor says, but is it, is, is it not that, is, is that not a rather irreverent way for Thompson to be talking about God, calling him a hound? What does he mean by comparing God to a hound? And then the author says, well, he, he means the pursuit of God. Oh, I see, Thompson is pursuing God, is he? Oh no, he is rather running from God. Well, then God is pursuing Thompson, is that it? Yes, that's it. But see here, according to Thompson's belief, God is everywhere, isn't he? Yes. Well, then how can God be going after Thompson? Is it a physical pursuit? No, it is a moral pursuit. A moral pursuit? What's that? What is God after? He is after Thompson's love. God is after Thompson's love. He's after Jim's love. He's after yours. And he's after mine. And he acts first, and we follow his commands out of love for him. So then that sort of brings us to this next question, which is, okay, what is that relationship with God really like? And this passage also addresses that. And to show us just how God loves us, this passage gives us the image of the vine and the branches. Everybody hear me fine? I'm not good. Yes. Terrible. Okay, great. So this kind of this brings us to our second point. God loves us. 
how do we describe, describe God's love for us, though? When you get to verse 9 in this passage, it should really blow you away. It's an incredible statement, and it is a revelation of just how intimately, how, how intimate with God our relationship actually is, or can be, or is supposed to be. He says this in verse 9, As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Take that in for a moment. Love you, Sammy. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. In other words, Jesus loves us, his followers, the same way that God the Father loves his Son. That love within the Trinity itself of the Father for the Son is the same way in which we are loved the same relationship that we can have with Christ. So a lot of this hinges on one particular word and also on a, uh, a powerful metaphor. And so first the word, that word is remain. What does it mean when Jesus says, remain in me and I in you? Um, as, uh, by way of a quick word study, um, oh good, you did get the second, the, the revised. <laughs> All right, so it's this word, um, I won't, I won't uh, you know, throw all kinds of Greek words at you and everything, but this is the one uh, word study in, in this sermon, meno or meno, um, has the sense of meaning remain or abide. We actually get the word remain from this um, ancient root, I'm, I'm fairly certain. Um, it, it has, it would be more like main, but uh, we don't use the word, we just use remain. So, um, uh, so that's why it's usually translated either remain or abide. Abide is a little bit, uh, we don't use that in everyday speech anymore, so more often it's translated remain. <clears throat> it's a really important word in here. It's used 11 times in this passage, and it's implied more times. It's used 40 times in the Gospel of John alone. And then it's also used another 27 times in his letters, some form of that word. So that should tell you that's a really important word. It's an important idea. And we have to ask that question. Okay, that's nice. It's a word study. Okay, great. But... What does it mean for us to remain in him and for him to remain in us? And actually, they're two slightly different things. We remain in him by being obedient, and he remains in us through the ongoing presence of the Holy Spirit. I'm going to circle back to this because I kind of explain it. So then we enter the metaphor. So first the word, remain, and then the metaphor, which is just the big baseball bat metaphor in this entire passage running through the whole thing of the vine and the branches, or the true vine and the branches, as Jesus calls himself in, in verse 1. So by way of a little context on this, this is the last of seven I am statements in John, and hopefully what that clues you into as you read the Gospel of John is that you realize that when Jesus says I am, he's making these really bold statements about his nature as God. And, and it's, it's not just a statement, it's a revelation of who he is as God. So this is the last of these statements. What it tells you is that he's revealing something about who he is as God. And what he's revealing um, is something about his relationship with his people, with his followers. What he re reveals is that he's the true vine as opposed to the vine or the vineyard of Israel. Not that Israel was bad, but Israel made mistakes and continued to fail. Throughout the Old Testament, um, the metaphor of the vineyard and the vineyard keeper is used as a metaphor to describe God and his relationship with his people. Um, one of the fantastic examples of this it is, is um, Isaiah 5, this passage, the song of the vineyard where um, it's this long parable about God's relationship with his people and how they're wandering away from him. Here it's distilled into simply not just uh, the idea of a vineyard, but it's, it's distilled all the way down to just, I am the vine and you are the branches. I'm the true vine and you are the branches. Um, by way of a little more historical context, the historian Josephus also records that there was on the door 
of the, or the, the entrance door to the temple in Jerusalem, there was an enormous vine with grapes on it. And so it's, it's possible that if Jesus is speaking in the temple courtyard, they can see this as a visual reference as he's speaking. And if not, it probably still blooms pretty large in their imagination. Israel failed as the vineyard of God. It also appears in the parables of the New Testament. But like I said, here it's distilled even further into this simple idea of a vine. So we come back to this question, how do we describe our relationship with God? It's like a vine and branches, very simple, okay? It's a parable, but it's not in a form that we're used to. God the Father is the gardener, Jesus is the vine, and we are the branches of that vine. Again, it's a very intimate connection between God the Father, Jesus the Son, and his followers, okay? So here's, um, I, I have to say, this reminds me of something that I grew up with, um, which is the idea that all of us have this sort of God-shaped hole in our lives, and it's just waiting to be filled. Um, some of you may remember Donut Man as well. Um, and on his show, he repairs, he's, he repairs that God-shaped hole that we all seem to have. Um, I asked Mark if he could play one of his songs today, but Phil objected to the mustache. <laughs> Um, although it may just be that he's jealous about his proximity to all the donuts, I don't know. <laughs> so while there is definitely truth to this idea that there's, there's something missing that we try to fill with things, um, at least in this passage, the picture seems to be almost the opposite. So it brings us back to Jim and to Francis Thompson. What was missing? Was God the one that was missing? Or maybe is it the other way around? Maybe what's missing is actually you and me. Maybe the hole isn't God-shaped. Maybe it's me-shaped and it's you-shaped. God isn't missing. He's been here the whole time. Mm -hmm. Anyway, don't hear what I'm not saying. Um, you know, there's definitely truth to this idea that, that we're missing something when we try to fill it with, with, with stuff all the time. But focusing on this passage. There's a, there's a different picture that emerges. So this powerful metaphor of the vine and the branches just reminds us how intimate our relationship with Jesus is. That describes the love that Jesus has for us. But the passage doesn't just end with that amazing statement of Jesus' love for us. The relationship also has a purpose. God loves us, yes, but he also commands us. It's a very strong word, isn't it? I think we kind of shy away from that idea of command because it sounds a little harsh and intimidating. Um, but it's going to be okay, I promise, because what he's commanding us to do is not, is not something terrible. So what does God command us to do? When we come to this final point here, we also see that our purpose is clearly put forth in the metaphor of the vine and the branches. And that purpose is to bear fruit. Purpose is to bear fruit. That's what the purpose is. So our relationship with God has a purpose, and it's to, to bear this fruit. This whole passage is about bearing fruit. As an extended metaphor, metaphor, it really makes a lot of sense. The first few verses lay this out. If you're a branch, but you're not part of the vine, you can't bear fruit. How can you bear fruit? You're disconnected. At the same time, if, if you are connected to the vine, but you're not bearing fruit, then there's a problem. And the solution, actually, according to this passage, is not up to you, which is kind of a relief, isn't it? The solution is that the gardener will prune you. It doesn't mean that he's going to snip you off and discard you. That's not the sense of pruning here. There is a warning here, but it's, it's important to understand what that warning actually is. The warning is not just to sort of make you feel bad or convict you to bear more fruit. The question isn't, am I bearing enough fruit? Uh-oh, God's gonna come prune me off if I don't bear enough fruit. A couple of commentators point out that a better translation of verse one may actually be, God lifts up the branches that don't bear fruit. And when it comes to this pruning idea, if you look at the language carefully, it says he prunes the branches that do bear fruit, and it's so that they will bear even more fruit. The pruning process is painful. 
right? That, that it is definitely painful. And those of you who have gone through difficult times in your life and remain faithful, you know that that pruning process is painful. But it's so that you bear more fruit. God is doing this on purpose so that you bear more fruit. The warning then is rather for those in verse 6 who do not remain in my love and explains very clearly what it means to remain in his love. We'll get to that in a second. They are the ones who are going to be gathered up like sticks and burned in the fire. So this whole first section is about bearing fruit and God doing things that actually help us, his followers, to bear that fruit. So the pruning might hurt, but ultimately it leads to bearing much fruit as opposed to just bearing fruit. That, of course, leads to the question, what is this fruit, then, that's so important that you have to bear? So you just think for a second, where else in the New Testament do we read about fruit? Sorry, that was a longer pause than it <laughs> Dramatic pause. Right. Um, anyway, the answer that I'm ho I hope you're, some of you are coming up with in your head is, oh yeah, the fruit of the Spirit. Right? As the Apostle Paul reminds us in Galatians 5, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. There's probably even a more specific one of these fruits that he has in mind here. This is where the command part comes in as well. What is it that Jesus commands his disciples to do in this passage? It says, I have a command for you. Verse 12 says this, my command is this, my command is this, love each other as I have loved you. And lo and behold, love is also the first of the fruits of the Spirit. So, let me step back a second, look at this passage. There are two really big ideas that this passage is connecting. One is remaining in God and he in us, so the idea of remaining, and the other is bearing fruit. Now, how are they connected? The answer is that they're connected through the Holy Spirit. We remain in Christ by obedience to his commands. That's what it says. To remain in me is to follow my commands. Anyone who remains in me follows my commands. If you don't follow my commands, you're not remaining in me. If you're not remaining in me, blah, 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 stick in the fire, blah, blah, blah. But, so, so we remain by obedience to his commands, and that, that command is to love each other. Amen. And on the other hand, Christ remains in, in us through the ongoing presence of the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit is actually the glue holding all of this vine and branches thing together. The Holy, the Holy Spirit actually, in, in a way, is the relationship that we have with Christ. He's on both sides. Even though it's an asymmetrical relationship, us remaining in him and him remaining in us are two different things. It's all accomplished by the power of the Holy Spirit in two different ways. Because loving each other sacrificially is the fruit of the Spirit. And we also know this because in the previous passage, we know this is about the Holy Spirit. In the previous passage in John 14, when Jesus is speaking to his disciples and he's talking to them about the fact that he's going to leave them. They don't totally understand, but he's taught, he's going through. This is what it means. I'm going to leave you, but in my place, I'm going to give you a spirit of understanding. He's talking about the Holy Spirit. And he tells his followers that he will send the spirit in his place. Jesus cannot remain with us physically. He's with the Father in heaven. But through the Holy Spirit, we have a relationship with him. That is his presence in our life. And as we bear the fruit of the Spirit, especially love, sacrificial love, where you lay down your life for your friends, which is exactly what he did. He says, I'm calling you friends. And then he says, true love is laying down your life for your friends. When we do that, he remains in us through that same Spirit. So the Holy Spirit is there to help us follow that command. So now for those of us who are branches in that vine, the command is clear. Love each other as Jesus have, has loved us. And I, it's, it's almost the same kind of intimacy. It's the same impact, the same power as when he says, 
um, I love you as the Father has loved me, right? Remain in my love. It's, it's just as powerful to love each other as Jesus has loved us. And that's the fruit that we should be bearing. So what we can ask ourselves is, am I bearing that kind of fruit? You know, and um, it's not something where I think any pastor would say, well, I'm doing it and you're not. You know what I mean? It's, we ask this of ourselves, am I bearing that kind of fruit? Are we bearing that kind of fruit? The passage is ultimately about loving your brothers and sisters. Do I love my brothers and sisters as Jesus loved me? Do I love sacrificial as sacrificially as Jesus commands his followers to do? So we're going to start wrapping it up here, okay? And to wrap it up, um, we're going to come back to this question of who's missing or what's missing. At the beginning, I told you the story about this man named Jim. Uh, you may be in some suspense. I don't know. Like, what happened to him? How did he get him? Um, so here's the epilogue of Jim. At first, Jim renounced acting completely and promptly joined a monastery. This is no joke. That didn't last very long because he fell in love with a woman, and so he knew that the monk thing probably wasn't going to last. But God's pursuit and love for Jim led him to seminary, led him eventually to ministry, and eventually even full circle all the way back around to acting. And so in the picture, that's the redeemed Jim you see as Hamlet. And it was, that performance was an electrifying performance. Jim inhabited this role of Hamlet with a spiritual energy that I've rarely seen on stage. His soliloquies, um, and Hamlet is famous for those soliloquies, you know, to be or not to be, um, where he's contemplating life and death. They're essentially conversations with God in his performance. It was incredible. Um, but taken together, his story highlights this question of what's missing. And so if your experience is anything like mine growing up, you're told from an early age to accept Jesus into your heart, which would be the first step to becoming a Christian. But what if that is not really the start? The start is that he's already pursued you and invited you. He's already loved you. On the other hand, maybe it is right to use that word accept because what we're doing really is an act of acceptance. We're, we're, we're taking what's already been offered. So this passage invites us to reorient the way that we think about our relationship with God, to sort of turn it around. Maybe it's not really about what's missing from us, maybe we are the thing that's missing. That makes sense at this point. But then to recognize this as a fact or recognize the truth of this is not enough. We also have a purpose and the purpose is to bear fruit. Our relationship with God does not exist simply for our own benefit. There's a command that comes with it. Love each other as I have loved you. And this is really a struggle. In fact, it's so hard that the Apostle John had to write several follow-up letters to his readers, those letters of John, the epistles of John, in which he laid it out even more urgently and starkly. In 1 John 4, 8, near the conclusion of his, his book, he writes, whoever does not love God does not know God because God is love. And then again in the same chapter, in verse 20, he says, if anyone says I love God but hates his brother, he is a liar. So we all probably rationalize or minimize our hatred or even just our lack of love for our brothers and sisters in Christ. Um, she's a hypocrite. He's so difficult to work with. She never listens to me. He's a Calvinist. He's not a Calvinist. It's just real. <laughs> I don't like what she says on social media. He's a Baptist. She's a Presbyterian, whatever. But Jesus himself commands us to love sacrificially. So it may just be a matter of asking, who am I holding bitterness or resentment toward that I may need to offer up sacrificially? Because it is giving something up. You're giving something up. 
Do I need to go to anyone and find a way to reconcile? Do I need to forgive someone? Um, as my wife and I were discussing this um, earlier, uh, she also pointed out that you know love is not just love is not just uh, sacrificial love is not just passive. It's just it's not just not doing something. It's also proactive. So, are there proactive ways in which I need to exercise this love for someone? Do I need to reach out to someone? Do I need to take care of my neighbor? Do I need to um, check in on someone? What is it that I need to do? Do I need to meet someone else's needs? So and I'm gonna I'm gonna close up here, but I'm gonna end with this question or, or, or this with, with this invitation basically. If you believe that God is calling you to that sacrificial love, to love someone in particular, and you need help, would you join me in this closing prayer? Father in heaven, we, we're sinners, and we struggle in so many ways, but we recognize the true intimacy that you desire with us and that, that, we, that we already have if we accept it. Um, we ask that you would convict us through the work of your Holy Spirit to... Um, and, and empower us and enable us to follow that command to love each other as you loved us. It's, it's very, it can be very challenging. But I ask that you, through our relationship with you, that you would enable us to be obedient to that command, and that we would find really specific ways in our life to practice that. We ask these things again. Um, knowing that you will answer our prayer, and in the name of your son Jesus. Amen. Amen.